All right, welcome back to the fifth iteration of the High Yield Rapid Pharmacology Review. I'm Mike Fiore, and later you'll be hearing from Mina. As always, um, you know, everything we say in this, you do have to take with a grain of salt, a whole heap of salt. We're sort of playing Vegas here. We took the course last year. We know what was uh, on the exams. We were able to see the questions that were on the exams, but uh, you know we're not working in conjunction with any of the professors at the school. So you know I can never make a promise that everything we say is going to be 100% accurate with regards to the professors. So if the professors said it a different way than we did, uh, you know know what they said, and you know we're going to just try to do our best to give you the highest yield information that's going to show up on your test. So. Fortunately, we moved to a little bit more of a gross subject in my mind, but you know, we have a, what is it, three more weeks, two to three more weeks left of the semester or the, till the holiday break, so we're almost there. So we'll start with the antifungal. So just to start off with a question, a 57-year-old man with a recent history of Untreated HIV presents to the physician with a headache, nausea, vomiting, and a change in mental status. He has no nuchal rigidity. Lumbar puncture is uh, noted to have a high opening pressure. A preparation for his uh, bronchiovular lavage with India ink shows you this. Uh, I don't know if you guys have done um, how far along in micro, but this if you see this, you, you should already know it's cryptococcal, uh, cryptococcus. Um, appropriate intravenous treatment has been begun. A few hours later, the patient experiences intense chills and spikes of fever. Laboratory values reveal hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hyperglycemia. Which of the following drugs is responsible for the patient's new onset fever and chills? So this is a classic uh, question, and uh, the way it's phrased here is instead of giving you the name of the drug, you have to know the mechanism, and that's something we'll get into uh, quite a bit when we talk uh, about antifungals because that's one of the areas where they can really test you and it's one of the focuses of, of the things that you really have to know. And so the answer is A. So those are the side effects of amphotericin and uh, amphotericin is an er ergosterol binding agent that uh, forms pores and has cells contents leak out. Next question. 75-year-old man comes to the health clinic noticing a burning sensation in his mouth and some whitish film on his tongue and the inside of his cheeks. That should be a um, you know, red alert for candidiasis. Um, his past medical history is significant for long-standing asthma. Again, another sort of uh, a clue that should key you off as to he's probably on steroids and most likely is using them incorrectly. Ah, then the next part of the question. He was recently prescribed an inhaled steroid following an acute asthma exacerbation only further um, further proves the point. So now which of the following agents is the most appropriate for the, uh, for the patient? So this is a very, very common question that uh, you know hopefully we'll let you know uh, how to treat. Um, so just to give you guys a clue, usually with oral candidiasis, specifically in the mouth or in the esophagus, we tend to use topical niastatin, so a, a swish and swallow or a swish and spit preparation. So those were a few of our questions and now we'll like to jump into my favorite part where I take the piece from Firecracker, a nice picture, and then I hide them away so you sort of have to guess what, what is going on here. So number one, what are our squalene epoxidase inhibitors? They are, or it is, our terbenafine. Number two, what are our 14-alpha demethylase inhibitors? Those are our azoles. Number three, we're looking for a cell wall inhibitor. This is a little confusing. So, you know, I always just like to make it be known that uh, terbenafine and then our ergosterol synthesis inhibitor azoles are working on the cell membrane, and it's a key point to make because you know our cells have cell membranes, so there's a lot of toxicities with these drugs. However, this is a cell wall inhibitor, and those are our econocandidates, caspofungin and mycofungin. We talked about it just now, our ergosterol pore-forming drugs. 
uh, amphotericin and then niastatin also works in that way. However, it's a little more toxic, so it's not used as often uh, orally. And then finally, going into our nucleus and our DNA slash RNA inhibitor in the fungal cell is fucytosine. So just a few general principles, sort of our big picture. Now fungus. Fungus has special fungal membrane characteristics. For example, the cell membrane contains ergosterol, which is a cholesterol-like substance. That is not in our cell membranes. So squalene, desqualene, epoxidase, lanosterol, ergosterol. So you have sort of this sequence of synthesis in our fungal cell membranes, and this is a target we can have. In addition, uh, fungal cells also have glucans, which are glucose polymers that are a little bit different than the polymers that we have in our cell walls. So here are two targets that we can, uh, here are two things that we can target to specifically try to uh, kill fungal cells. So how do we do that? As I said before, we try to inhibit cell membrane synthesis with linosterol synthesis being specifically terbenafine and then inhibiting ergosterol synthesis specifically with azoles. We can also inhibit cell wall synthesis by inhibiting beta glucan synthesis using our acanocannidids or our fungins like mycofungin and caspofungin. We can also punch holes in our ergosterol cell membrane courtesy of amphotericin and niastatin. We can inhibit DNA-RNA synthesis via flucytosine, and then we can also work on those uh, funky um, spindle cells or our uh, centrioles and inhibit mitosis courtesy of briseofolin. Now, one last little overview before we get into the drugs. We're just going to talk about some of the different types of fungal infections. I'm sure you've gone into much more detail in micro, but we're just going to sort of uh, uh, neatly wrap them in a little package for you. So, systemic funguses that we like to work about, worry about are your histos, your blastos, your coccidioides, and your paracoccidiocosis. So, these are primarily treated with azole antifungals and amphotericin for severe systemic diseases. We have our three main cutaneous fungus, our malasia, our dermatophytes, which is the most common form of tinnias, and then our sporothrix. These are mostly treated topically by azoles, and then they also can be treated with terbenafin, griseofulvin, and then sporothrix. If you have watched this sketchy micro, you know the potassium iodide can be used to treat it. Finally, we have some of our uh, opportunistic bugs, like our candidas, our aspergillus, our cryptococcus, and many more. Specifically, uh, you want to treat these with azoles, canocanidids, amphotericin, and niastatin, fucytosine for our more uh, uh, you know, systemic ones or more um, distributed ones. Specifically for PCP or pneumocystis jovidi, you want to know Bactrim. You want to know uh, SMX or, or sulfomethoxis ultramethoprim. That's sort of uh, a buzzwordy treatment for the PCP pneumonia. Um, and so this goes back to some of the conversations we've had in the class or in the review sessions before. A lot of times during the, the session, you'll ask specifically, you know, like, what do you specifically use to treat Canada? And, and honestly, like, you know, there are some situations, like I had explained in the previous question, you know, you want to use oral niastat. But a lot of times, you know, there's a couple of different things that you could technically use for different things. So again, you know, I'll, I'll point out specific examples, but you want, don't want to get too hung up on, I treat, you know, this specific fungus with this specific, um, you know, antifungal treatment, because a lot of times there are a few different things that you can use. I want you as we go forward to focus more on some of the side effects that are highlighted and uh, the mechanism of action, because a lot of times they will really try to test the mechanism by you know, as we did in our very first question with amphotericin, they'll point out side effects and then you'll have to know the mechanism. But, you know, that's a second order question, having to know the name of the drug and then the side effect. All right, so we'll start off with uh, uh, some of the more commonly used one, our azole antifungals. So there are quite a few. We have clotrimazole, fluconazole, itriconazole, ketoconazole, and the other last two. Specifically, uh, you know, a little helpful way to remember is they all end in nasal, so it's one of the nice clean drugs that uh, the name helps you remember what it is. These uh, specifically inhibit 14-alpha-demethylase. 
This works in converting lanesterol to ergosterol, that key component of the cell membrane of the fungus. These are used for local and less severe systemic fungal infections. So they can actually be used first line for dermatophyte or tinea infections topically. In addition, we can use fluconazole for chronic cryptococcal meningitis and some candida infections. Itraconazole can be used for blasto, coccidioides, and histo. Uh, histo. Clomitrazole and myconazole are most often prepared in topical formations. You won't see them uh, given orally as much. And voriconazole can be used for aspergillus and invasive candida. So you'll have noticed I said fluconazole can be used to treat candida. It can voriconazole can also be used to treat candida. So there's 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 a lot of crossover with some of these. So again, I really wouldn't get too hung up on specific uses. The ones I would know if you had to, you know, if you held, you know, if you you really wanted me to tell you something, I would say fluconazole is quite often uh, asked about for chronic cryptococcal meningitis. That uh, first question we talked about, they patient had uh, crypto, but you could also have used um, fluconazole if it wasn't as severe. Um, I would know that clotrimazole and myconazole are used topically, and that's about it. Side effects. Some of the side effects that go along with all of them are inhibiting uh, testosterone synthesis. Now, they're... Um, uh, the 14-alpha demethylase is very similar to our SIP enzymes, and our SIP enzymes, as you all know, uh, are used in the liver to detoxify drugs, but they're also very similar to the enzymes that are used to create um, uh, hormones like estrogen and testosterone. So there can be some cross-contamination, some cross-fire, and these drugs can actually inhibit the enzymes that are used to make testosterone. So, you know, downstream effect, you could actually have gynecomastia, and that's often a side effect that's sort of correlated to ketoconazole. So, you see an older man who has some sort of fungal infection and he's been given ketoconazole, I can bet that there's a gynecomastia side effect in there somewhere. In addition, as I said before, these can have some potent liver side effects because they are SIP inhibitors, because the 14-alpha demethylase is very similar to the SIP enzyme. So lots of drug interactions with the azoles and just general uh, liver toxicities. A little bit more specific, as I talked about before, ketoconazole itself has been known to cause quite a bit of gynecomastia and some of the side effects that come uh, with lower testosterone, decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and, you know, in women, menstrual irregularities. As I also uh, said, adrenal stereogenesis. So, you know, not only can you actually inhibit testosterone formation, but you can also screw up cortisol and um, uh, mineralocorticoid, uh, like aldosterone creation. So, you know, it can actually cause some adrenal dysfunction. And then, as I said before, it's very hepatotoxic, ketoconazole specifically. Fluconazole. Fluconazole you want to remember because it has the least amount of SIP interactions and it has the lowest range of activity in different um, f for the for the spectrum of antifungal. So you'll actually see this used quite a lot because it's actually the safest. This is um, probably the most often used drug for women coming in with uh, uh, vaginal fungal infections. You'll get one dose of fluconazole and within a few days it'll clear up. It also has CSF penetration. That's why you can also see it be used, as I said before, with cryptococcal meningitis and AIDS patients. And finally, this one you do want to worry about QT prolongation. Now, itriconazole and voriconazole both share the side effect of visual disturbances. They both do, even though it is only mentioned in itriconazole, they both do cause hepatotoxicity. That is sort of a class effect. And then finally, with voriconazole, in addition to some of the visual disturbances, you can see some, I'm sorry, I wrote SJS, it's Stephen Johnson syndrome and uh, hallucinations. So, you know, some of these drugs that will be asked, I don't think you would have to differentiate between the two, which is causing hallucinations or visual disturbances, but you should know that these two specifically do have some sort of uh, hallucinogenic properties.
All right, now we're moving on to our echinocandids. These are our caspofungin and mycofungin. So I talked about before, these are inhibiting our beta-glucan synthesis. So these are our cell wall inhibitors in um, our fungal, our funguses. So with this specifically, they're, they're a little bit more toxic. We have some GI upset and some flushing, and they tend to only be used for invasive aspergillus and candida. So these are sort of our second line agents for when um, infections become truly invasive. We would tend to use uh, amphotericin first or maybe an azole, but if a patient is unable to tolerate those drugs, then we move to our echinocandids. We're a little bit of an older drug. Both of them are older drugs. Now, our heavy hitter, amphotericin. This is probably one of the, if not for the azoles, probably the most important drug. You gotta know everything on this page as it comes to amphotericin. You really wanna remember this specifically is binding to ergosterol and it's forming holes or pores in the cell membrane. So this allows for you know leakage of the cell's content and its eventual death but you know if you can tie that to a side effect it also allows for electrolyte leakage so you can understand why it can cause you know low potassium low magnesium and other sort of side effects that come with them um, or just electrolyte abnormalities so uses these are for the most part used saved for serious systemic and opportunistic fungal infections now I talked about some of the electrolyte abnormalities. This also has an infusion reaction. It can cause fevers, chills, muscle spasm, and hypotension. And Botericin is a very, very, uh, you know, it's not a very well tolerated drug and it has a lot of side effects. As you can, you know, imagine a patient coming in with a fungal infection is most likely going to be very sick as it is. And this, this drug tends to push them to get even sicker. In addition to the, so to combat the infusion reaction they created a liposomal formulation so they actually you know in a laboratory were able to create my cells or little lipid balls and actually put the amphotericin inside of those my cells to allow for less uh, side effects on the administration of the drug so we have less of the infusion reaction and then we also have left nephrotoxicity which is our you know, one of another very important side effect that you do want to remember for amphotericin it is very nephrotoxic. In addition, it can also cause liver function abnormalities. It can cause anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia. So it is, uh, you know, a very toxic drug. So just to uh, reiterate some of the key points, we're going to bind to ergosterol in the cell membrane of the fungus and form pores. Those pores are going to allow for the cell's contents to leak out. We're saving this drug for serious systemic and opportunistic fungal infections. It can have an infusion reaction, fevers, chills, and hypotension. It is renal toxic. It can cause a whole host of electrolyte abnormalities. Specifically, we always want to remember which way K is going. It causes hypokalemia and it can cause hypomagnesemia. Finally, it can also be used in pregnancy if you have a woman who is coming in for whatever reason with some sort of systemic fungal infection. Niastatin. Niastatin is used. Niastatin, the mechanism of action is the same as infotericin. It binds to ergosterol and it forms uh, holes in the cell membrane. Now, because it's a little bit more toxic than infotericin, it's really only used orally as a swish and swallow for oral candida, as we talked about in that second question, and also uh, for dipo rash and any other sort of uh, uh, candida infection topically. Flucytosine. Flucytosine is, is uh, another drug that's sort of saved for more systemic fungal infections. So this is converted to 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, by cytosine deaminase in the fungal cell. And then once it is converted into 5-fluorouracil, it works as a chain terminator to inhibit DNA and RNA synthesis. So, you know, you've heard of it before, but it's sort of been given a new name and it's used in a new way. You all know, you all remember, I'm sure, all of the chemotherapy drugs. Just kidding, nobody does. 5-fluorouracil is a chemotherapy drug and it is a chain terminator. So now you just need to remember that flucytosine is 5-fluorouracil for uh, fungal infections. 
Specifically, it's used for cryptococcal meningitis with amphotericin, and because it's a chain terminator, we can have lots of bone marrow suppression side effects, anemia, thrombocytopenia, uh, leukemia, uh, uh, leukemia, all of those. Okay, last few I talked about before, griseofulvin. So this has a, a couple key points that you want to remember. Now this is another one of those microtubule inhibiting drugs that uh, will inhibit mitosis by inhibiting the microtubules. And it specifically deposits in keratin tissues, specifically nails. Therefore, we really like to use it for some dermatophyte tinea infections, tinea capitis, but also for superficially for um, um, uh, nail infections. Sorry, orally for nail infections. However, there are a lot of side effects, so it tends to not really be used as much. Side effects, it is teratinogenic. And also, key, key point, we've talked a lot in the review sessions so far about in inhibitors of the CYP450 systems, but this is one of the first drugs we might have talked about that's actually an inducer of the CYP450 system. Therefore, if it's inducing the CYP450, you're going to have more metabolism of some of the drugs. So for example, if you have a patient on warfarin, there would be more metabolism of warfarin, their INR would go down, and they would have a clot form. Again, for our oral contraceptives, you could actually reduce your oral contraceptive level and then actually, you know, have an event where, you know, a patient may become pregnant. Just as a side note, some other drugs that are, you know, just a reminder that uh, inhibit microtubules. We have griseofulvin, bendazole, which you'll learn about a little bit later. It's an antiparasitic, colchazine, our anti-gout drug, vincristine, vinbastine, and paclitaxel, three of our uh, more chemotherapy drugs that keep on coming back. Now we have terbenafin. So this is one of our squalene epoxidase inhibiting drugs that inhibit ergosterol synthesis, but this is sort of a step before the azoles. So these work in a similar pathway that the azoles do, only a step before inhibiting squalene epoxidase specifically, and then eventually downstream inhibiting ergosterol synthesis, and then you are not able to form your cell membrane. These are used for dermatophyte infections, so or tinea infections, and they are actually first line for oncomycosis or uh, nail infections or fungal infections. However, azol is actually still the first line for topical dermatophyte or tinea infections because the azoles topically have way less um, uh, uh, side effects. Additionally, the big thing you want to remember about terbenafin, it is very hepatotoxic. 